Okay, in part two of the week five lectures on consumption, I'm going to mostly talk about um, critical theory of the Frankfurt School and conclude a little bit with Daniel Miller, who's kind of like a anti-Frankfurt School theorist, just to kind of get a bit of more, more positive spin. So to begin with, it would be a good idea, I think, just to click on the 10-minute Adorno um, uh, animation there, and there's a couple of other uh, videos there. If you're more interested, you can look at those as well. But I think that smaller um, the, 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 uh, animation one is a good way to kind of think and situate Adorno's work in the wider kind of critique of capitalism that the Frankfurt School were interested in before I go into the more specifics about um, their work on consumption. So the Frankfurt School were founded in um, the 20s in, in Germany. Um, they're, you know, hugely influential social theorists, people like Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse, Benjamin, um, Eric Fromm, up until like um, more recent um, and contemporary theorists like Jürgen Habermas were um, trained by those original theorists. So they still have um, huge influence in the understanding of consumer culture, pop culture and the critique of capitalism generally. Um, they're hugely influenced by Marx and have very much Marxist ideas in, in their work. Um, and they're trying in, in that sense to address why that kind of Marxist, predi Marxist prediction of revolution didn't happen. So they didn't really believe that the production side of things and the alienation exploitation involved in that was enough to explain um, what was happening in the 20th century in particular, you know, um, years after Marx was writing about industrial revolution. But they developed a lot of those ideas and developed a critical approach for thinking about you know, how things stay the same and how things change. So the term critical theory is very much pro um, a, a, a around the Frankfurt School, it kind of comes from them. Um, and critical theory here is that idea of the way of thinking about um, the problems of inequalities and how people relate to each other and how things can be better. So I'm going to just uh, focus on some, you know, briefly on some of their key ideas in relation to the consumer culture. So they're, I suppose, concerned with why, you know, huge levels of exploitation or alienation haven't really led to a collective class consciousness that's led to some kind of new organi organisation of society. And rather than focusing, focusing on the production side of things, start to focus on leisure, um, on the things that people are doing outside of their work lives, I suppose. So this leads to um, focus on consumption. Now, consumption here is very loosely involves not just things you eat and not things you buy, but also things like your consumption of popular culture. Um, so consumption and consumer culture here also includes the songs you listen to, the films you watch, um, you know, the TV shows today you've been maybe be watching on Netflix and, and Stan and all those kind of things. For the Frankfurt School theorists, these products of what they call the culture industry um, largely mitigate alienation, but they also contribute to it in various ways as well. They produce kind of in some ways new forms of alienation. Um, importantly, what's important to consider here is that a lot of popular culture actually is quite critical of capitalism or kind of, you know, highlights relations of exploitation and alienation. But importantly here, um, it kind of almost redoubles those things because it seems to make clear to us that there's not much we can do about these things as individuals. For the Frankfurt School and particularly the likes of Adorno, the culture industry, the things like, you know, the huge industries that produce film, produce music, increasing today the gaming industry, which is the kind of largest um, economy of pop culture. Um, they produced all these kind of different things for us to consume. And even though we feel like they're different and they entertain us in a variety of ways, for those kind of these critical theorists, are largely the same. There's not a lot of creativity going on there. And within them, they're mostly purveying different forms of capitalist ideology. That is things like, you know, encourages to consume more and more, encourages not to think too much about politics or the environment, um, encouraging, encouraging us largely to come home, sit on the lounge and switch off and not think of too much about our place in the world. For Adorno, he coined the term pseudo individualization to think about the relations between people and the products of the culture industry. For Adorno, culture industry involves endowing cultural mass production with the halo of free choice. 
Um, so there's lots of examples of this, you know, you know, the pop song on the radio tends to go verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, end. As the diagram there says, there's only kind of, you know, I think seven narratives that kind of most kind of stories are told through. Um, in terms of stuff we buy, you know, you go to the supermarket and there's lots of almost identical products in just different coloured boxes. Um, you know, how different is the many, you know, many um, iterations of the iPhone? You know, they just tend to add a couple of new bells and whistles. For the likes of Adorno and Marcuse and other critical theorists, these um, products of the culture industry and the processes that it promotes, um, promotes what they call false needs. Um, that we're kind of impelled to want these things more and more, to kind of keep up, to be cool, to be normal or whatever. Um, but really these aren't needs at all, they're wants, and capitalism therefore um, keeps us distracted from our real species being by encouraging us to do these kind of forms of consumption. You know, what aren't we doing when we're sitting there consuming TV or listening to music? You know, we're not organising politically, um, we're not, um, you know, joining unions and you know, all this kind of stuff about making the world a better place. Importantly here also, though, is that as pop culture and art becomes more commercialised, these theorists become really concerned with how, you know, real human emotions, real human politics can be expressed through those things as they are made more and more to sell and to be mass-produced. Um, so Walter Benjamin in particular was a key theorist there who argued that... Um, as the works of art become produced for reproduction, that is, you know, to be viewed in magazines or to be sold, um, the logic of art reproduces capitalist ideology rather than reproducing um, critique or emotional um, expression. So what we're talking about here is a kind of cultural turn in sociology, the, moved, the shift from looking at relations of production to looking at relations of consumption. Um, so, the cultural terms, sociologists recognise that consumption of goods also reflected the nature, processes and experiences of contemporary society as much as our kind of position as workers. And this particularly starts to relate to ideas of identity. Um, and many kind of contemporary theorists argue that we create and construct and perform our identities through our kind of consumption performances and practices more so than what we do as, um, for a living. So when you meet people, you're more likely to maybe talk about your interests and the things you like, rather than say, you know, I'm a um, sociologist or a student or a doctor or a teacher or an uh, electrician. So again, the sensible thing there with identity is that all these things still matter. There's not really either or here, but um, this kind of shift in the 60s started to look more at these consumption practices. So it's argued, therefore, that we live in what's called a consumer culture. In this sense, consumption and consumption practices, and again, it's not just the food and we eat and the clothes we buy, it's the, also the things we consume in terms of pop culture and um, doing our leisure practices. This is the prominent mode of social activity and organisation. This means in terms of our self-identity, what clothes we buy, what services we use, what music um, we listen to, what brands, what technology we use, is a key way of expressing ourselves. It becomes a way of life, a lifestyle. Um, much of the sociological analysis of this increasingly shows how people, you know, from different classes, different genders, different sexualities, different races and ethnicities, practice this consumerism in different ways, which kind of challenges the uh, Frankfurt School analysis in some ways. Um, and this becomes a key area of sociological research to consider um, the way that people live their day-to-day -day lives, the way that kind of culture, industries and institutions affect us, um, and, you know, what it means to kind of be happy and to be satisfied. That I'll talk about in the uh, fourth video today. So consumption practices in this sense become to define our sense of self. And as I was saying earlier, the kind of critique of this um, has built into a lot of pop culture. And as Zizek kind of talks about in the They Live video, the realisation that we're kind of trapped in this capitalist ideology and the critique of it almost kind of doubles down, redoubles on that ideology. It seems that there's no escape and we just kind of then get on with it and accept it. So much of the more recent theorising around this kind of stuff points out how people are increasingly cynical about consumption practices. They know the environmental um, destruction that it leads to and 
increasingly know um, and realise maybe that much consumer practices are rather empty and vapid and don't actually provide us with much meaning or happiness. But there's kind of no alternative. People just kind of get snarky, um, become more and more ironic and just kind of get on with it. Um, there's, again, lots of really interesting writing about what that means in terms of um, our lifestyles today. So, the critical theorists are very negative, they don't have a lot of good stuff to say about the way that we live. Um, and what's important to remember with the critical theorists and Frank Sewell is you can't really make distinctions um, in pop culture or consumer culture and say that, okay, these things are better than others or whatever. So, um, you know, you can't kind of have a Frankfurt School perspective on the things you don't like and say that the things that you like are more meaningful and political because as far as the Frankfurt School goes, if it's produced in the culture industry, it's a product of ideology. An example that I would use here is a band that was really influential on me was Rage Against the Machine in the 90s, had all kinds of really political lyrics, actually had reading lists on the inner sleeves of their... Um, of their records um, and CDs and, you know, I read a lot of those books, was really influential on, on my own kind of progression. Um, but from the Frankfurt School point of view, that's still just pop culture, really, you're not really doing anything there when you're listening to Rage and Machine or going to a, a gig other than kind of jumping up and down and having fun. Um, so it's a really kind of all-encompassing point of view and they point to various forms of culture and art that are kind of anti-capitalist, but certainly popular stuff is not that. In terms of a kind of critique of that point of view, uh, a theorist, uh, Daniel Miller, who's an anthropologist, has kind of spent a whole career showing that how consumer culture and pop culture, it's not just that simple to write it off as ideology. He doesn't deny that um, pop culture and consumer culture plays an ideological role in similar ways that the Frankfurt School point out. But really in our day-to-day -day life, um, the things we consume have all kinds of meaning. And for Miller, he relates this kind of to anthropological histories around rituals and the gift that, you know, throughout um, millennia that um, these things have always played a key role in the ways that people relate to each other and communicate and live. So if you're interested in what Miller has to say, I really recommend the book The Comfort of Things. It's a beautifully written book. Um, and essentially, it was a, a long kind of term anthropological study in 30 households in the same street in London, um, where he was going in with um, research assistants and getting people to talk about um, the kind of personal meanings and attachments that they have to the things in their house and how these things often become expressions of themselves and importantly expressions to the relations to the other important people in their lives. So while, you know, having a kind of huge spoon collection from all the places you've been around the world or a fridge magnet collection is kind of an expression of those experiences, um, Miller says that there's kind of more going on um, when we think about our things and when we kind of um, have start to develop strong relations to things. So two examples in the book that I think stand out for me is um, a kind of professional middle-class mother who was deliberately taking her kids to McDonald's once a week to the horror of all her other professional middle-class mothers and particularly to her kind of snooty parents. Um, one of the reasons she did this is, is that she enjoyed pissing off her parents because um, her parents annoyed her in terms of the way that she was brought up in a house with kind of really kind of antique furniture that she could never open the drawers of as a kid, so she deliberately therefore has IKEA furniture to make everything more easy for her kids. Um, she also found that when she was going to McDonald's in her kind of really busy life, that there was on the placemats all these exercises you could do with the kids, and they, she found that she was having these kind of real kind of communicative moments with her children. Uh, there was like a, a promotion with Snoopy dolls that were all from different countries around the world, so. They'd collect the dolls and then they'd go home and then look up the country of the internet and all of a sudden this kind of trip to McDonald's was an educational experience. Another example in the book is a guy that was a former heroin addict that had a huge record collection and a, and a bunch of photos that he used as kind of almost a crutch to kind of, I suppose, try and stay off the drugs. Um, when he started to feel bad, he would listen to a particular record to make him feel good or he'd go and have a look at his photos of his daughters of family or whatever to try and make sure that he would, you know, not relapse. So in this kind of analysis, the everyday life and the things that we have in them aren't necessarily ideology all the time or promoting particular ideology. We can have kind of emotional relationship to these things that express a bunch of other relations, other, a bunch of other emotions that in Miller's work 
go beyond the ideological. So I think that's really worthwhile um, checking out if you want to kind of move beyond the pessimism of the Frankfurt School. So in the next section, what I'm going to do is talk about some other points of view to kind of look at consumer culture a little bit um, more in terms of relations between different groups and the different meanings they have. So in terms of asking some sociological questions here, why, why we should study stuff, i.e. the things we consume, um, you know, what do material surroundings really say about a person or a society anyway? Um, what objects have you bought and do you own? What, does they, what do these things say about you? What does the space that you live in look like? And what does this kind of stuff say about your own lifestyle, your own attitude towards, you know, other people, other things, the environment? How do things like class, gender, ethnicity, religion, and all these kind of stuff become expressed through the things that we buy and the practices in terms of pop culture and consumer culture that we pursue? And what does this say about your own morals, values, and ethics? And I'll talk a little bit about that in part four. Um, after I talk about subcultures and semiotics in the next lecture video.